thanks a lot, Vusi. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, Vusi gave me uh, this one pager uh, to invite me to come here this evening. I I want to to read part of it to you, the, the first line, I can show this to you, to circulate it if you want to see. The first line is alumni dinner. So that's why we've met, for dinner. And then it's got all sorts of other irrelevant matters underneath. <laughs> uh, <coughs> So I think the sooner we get to the dinner, the better. <laughs> but let me say congratulations indeed to everybody for the initiative to, to set up this uh, alumni forum. It's, it is indeed, I, I think, a very, very important initiative. I think for the reasons which uh, all three of our speakers have, have, have indicated. Um, also, I'd like to, to, to say best wishes to the interim committee, uh, the chair and, and, uh, and everybody else. Um, I will come back to what I think is one particular challenge that you're going to face tomorrow uh, with regard to the tasks that you, you have to, to carry out. But I, I, I would like to hope that especially the interim committee, but other uh, m m members of the forum, uh, would have listened carefully to what uh, Professor Parking, uh, Obenewa, and Gareth said, because I think basically all, of, all three of them conveyed uh, one message uh, in one form or another, what uh, Obenewa said now, just now, about daring to invent the future. And Gareth was saying something about impatience with the status quo. Uh, and indeed, uh, Professor Parking said, uh, uh, we have empowered you, given you the confidence, the wisdom, the knowledge uh, to be able indeed to, to change Africa for the better. I, I do hope that uh, uh, all of us have, have listened uh, to, to all of that. And in the end, what has got to come out of the meetings tomorrow, Gareth was saying that uh, they are continuing the discussions tomorrow, is uh, uh, some program of action. What, in terms of being these instruments of change, of changing this reality with which we are impatient, the status quo, which we don't, we don't accept, of being uh, inventing this future, um, what is, practical, what is it practically that we'll have to do? I think that's a, very, that's a particular challenge. Uh, I don't know what you people are going to decide, uh, but let me tell you a, a story. I've been in the last three, four weeks, uh, I've been in four major cities in the world. I was in Beijing, and then London, then Lagos, and Abuja. Um, in Beijing, we went there for a very interesting discussion at the invitation of the Communist Party of China. And you know, the Communist Party of China invited us and other people from around the world uh, to discuss an important issue. Uh, it was uh, a bit startling for us as Africans. They wanted us to discuss the issue of corruption in ruling parties. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, this is a ruling party of China. And they said, let us meet to discuss this matter of corruption in ruling parties. And we, the Chinese, are going to tell you about corruption in our party. And they did. It brought all sorts of people to explain what was happening with this corruption and its impact in terms of political governance, in terms of economic development, in terms of everything. Um, it was a fascinating discussion. 
And indeed, uh, <clears throat> and as I say, the topic was uh, corruption in the ruling party. Now, none of us, certainly the Africans, were there. We didn't talk about that as far as our ruling parties are concerned. <laughs> we're quite happy to comment on what the Chinese Communist Party is. <laughs> I'm mentioning it because it was fascinating that they they have that kind of uh, courage to look at themselves and to say, "But here is here is a problem which is impacting negatively on everything that we're trying to do in China, uh, and therefore we must address it openly." Uh, they even brought uh, members of the judiciary there because they explained what the party itself is doing to fight corruption in its ranks, but how the state, also the courts, the police, and so on, interact with that to ensure that the state system is not intimidated by the fact of the, of the ruling party to say that this is a member of the Politburo and uh, whatever, and therefore they are untouchable. But for the party to be saying to the state organs, if we, the, the Communist Party, are fighting this thing against our own membership, the responsibility of the state are according to the law. And you can't, you can't say, because uh, these are people who are high in the party and government and so on, are therefore untouchable. Now, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if this is going to be part of your program of action tomorrow. Because indeed, that is an important challenge on our continent. I think if we look around, throughout the continent, it really would be very difficult to find a ruling party that has no corruption in it. I think it would be extremely difficult. I'd be a challenge everybody. Obenawa was challenging people to raise their hands. I'd ask anybody to tell me one ruling party on the continent that's not touched by corruption. And I know there's no hand that's going to go up. <coughs> it's an important challenge because of its impact. It's bad in itself, but it has an impact on all of these things we're trying to do. This invent invention of the future and then this, this, this change of the status quo. Um, is this one of the matters on which the alumni forum should focus? Uh, but certainly for those of us who were in Beijing, we. Uh, we found this a very, a very important challenge, and uh, drew great, great, great inspiration from the fact that the, the, the Communist Party of China could so openly and consistently discuss this matter, uh, including mentioning names. I think the, at that point when we were there, that's three weeks, three and a half weeks ago, uh, the highest person uh, at that point that had been caught in the party system, and the party was dealing with this, was a member of the Central Committee, was responsible for intelligence throughout China. And so they were saying, uh, this person involved in corruption in the following way, and therefore the party must take whatever disciplinary action it does, and later the, the, the state, the state organs would also take their own, their own actions. I'm giving that as an example of the challenge that this alumni forum is going to face. To identify what are these interventions we want to make on the continent. And I'm saying that uh, they won't be easy if we want to be as effective as we, as we indeed need to be effective. Then I was saying that we, I went to London 
I was invited there to attend some meeting. I couldn't quite understand why, but anyway, we went. <laughs> and in this, it was one of these uh, NGOs, and they, at their board was meeting, and they said, please, we would like you to come and talk to us, and so on. So anyway, we went. And during the course of the discussion, somebody posed a question, which was then discussed, which was, should Africa continue to be a member of the ICC, of the International Criminal Court? Uh, and this evoked a very interesting and a hot discussion. And uh, very varied people, a uh, community of people, the Africans, Europeans, Americans, and, and so on. And interestingly, the overwhelming view was the Africans should pull out of the ICC. Um, there was a story that was told uh, about how uh, Connie, this leader of the Lord's Resist Resistance Army in Uganda, uh, about how he came to uh, the charge, the warrant issued by the International Criminal Court. I was very glad to listen to that story because uh, we had discussed this thing with the leadership in, in Uganda uh, and then, then agreed about how to handle it because it was important to, to end the activities of the LRA. And we're looking at what is it that needs to be done to do that. And the communities in northern Uganda uh, that had been very severely affected by all this uh, had agreed that they were prepared to engage with Connie and his people uh, to end this conflict and to deal with everything to do with reconciliation and then all of that. And they were including using traditional ways and means and, and all of that. And indeed, uh, negotiations started uh, uh, in Juba, in South Sudan, uh, chaired by uh, the then uh, uh, Vice President of Sudan, uh, uh, Riek Machar. And then all of a sudden, uh, Connie gets charged at the ICC. Talks broke down, and Connie disappeared into the bush, where he, I don't know where he is now, uh, <laughs> And so I, it, it puzzled me why, how this thing had happened. Uh, because it's not only the government of Uganda, but the population that had been directly affected by this understood what it is that needed to be done to solve this problem. But at this meeting in London, uh, I then discovered that it was actually a decision taken in Washington. Yeah, he decided there in the U.S. government that, no, this man needs to go to the ICC. And that's how Connie ends up where he, did, where he is. Um, I spoke there about uh, um, President Bagbo of, of Cote d'Ivoire, um, who was on trial, who was under, under arrest at The Hague, and is supposed to go on trial uh, next month in, in November. And I was saying that, you know, the uh, pre President Chisan, I don't know, people know here yeah, that there is something called the Africa Forum, which is uh, former heads of state and so on on the continent and, and other people leading Africans, uh, former secretaries of the UN, OAU, African Union, etc. Uh, Africa Forum, uh, the chair is President Chisan. Uh, who's coming next month to to do this Steve Biko lecture. Uh, he's written a letter on behalf of the forum to the uh, prosecutor at the International Criminal Court and says in the letter, um, we as Africans believe that uh, President Bagbo is critically important for the future of Cote d'Ivoire, 
for peace and reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire. And that if that matter is not addressed of peace and reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire, then Cote d'Ivoire is bound to have a civil war resume. So here we have a choice. You know what's happened there with the Bagbo case at the They've got a, what is called a pre-trial court. Now that's the prosecutor presents uh, uh, charges against whoever at the pre-trial court. The pre-trial court looks at the charges and assesses whether this case should go to trial. So where the prosecutor presented her evidence to the pre-trial court, this was, I think, 2013, if I remember well. It's, a, it's, a, it's three judges sitting together. And two of the judges say, Madam Prosecutor, you have no case against President Bagbo. One of the judges says, no, no, she has a case. But two say no. Now, instead of, I don't know how many lawyers there are here, but instead of saying, which is what I think a judge should have done in those circumstances, therefore, uh, President Bagbo is found not guilty and released. No, they instead say, we give you nine months to prepare better charges yeah, so that, uh, and, in the, and in the meantime, we'll keep him detained, which they did. And then uh, she comes back uh, to the court uh, earlier this year, uh, pre-trial court. One of the judges, two of the judges say, you now have got something which looks like a case. One of the judges says, you still don't have. Uh, but anyway, the majority say, no, let the matter go on trial. So that's why he will then appear on trial next month. But President Chisano is saying, but look, even the pre-trial court is very doubtful about the substance of this case. In the meantime, by keeping this man at the Hague, you are denying us, the Ivorians first of all, but the rest of the continent, the possibility to address this very important issue of peace and reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire in order to avoid a civil war that's going to be very destructive. So anyway, there we are. <coughs> I, I don't know whether the prosecutor has responded to President Chisano. But <coughs> so the question arises, uh, should Africa belong to the ICC? That's how the matter gets raised in London. Because this is our actual practical experience. I'm saying in the case of Kony, they were negotiating a resolution to this conflict that had taken so many lives, not only in Uganda, but also in that region. And we're going to find a solution. And then somebody said, no, off to the Hague. And the matter collapsed. And there's President Bagbo at the Hague. And the threat that faces us in Cote d'Ivoire is a resumption of civil war, which is going to claim the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Should Africans continue to be in the ICC? The committee will have to see whether, <laughs> whether this is a matter on which it should act. It is important because this issue about justice and peace, how do you deal with this challenge? Uh, given the amount of violence and the fighting and the conflicts and so on on the continent, this issue, justice and peace, is very much part of our challenges. How, to, how do we answer it? And then I was saying that I then went to Lagos and, and Abuja. And the reason I went to Lagos is because I was invited by the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Manufacturers Association of Nigeria is, is quite an old organization. It's 41 years old. Um, 
it's actually more than 41, but they were celebrate. They were meeting now at the 43rd annual general meeting uh, of the association. So they had asked me to come and, and, and speak there. Now, one of the interesting things is that, uh, so they say you must speak about manufacturing. It's a manufacturer's association. Speak about manufacturing. Uh, what are the challenges? What needs to be done? And, and all of that. Because we don't want to, don't want to continue to be these exporters of raw material and, and total materials and so on. Uh, so all right. So now I've got to appear among these Nigerians as though I know something about the issue. So I have to do a bit of studying. Uh, so what I, I get to understand, you know, Nigeria got its independence in 1960. Every single government there, whether military or civilian, every single government since then has had an industrialization policy. Every single one of them. And the Manufacturers Association uh, said to me, please, can you come and talk to us to talk about this thing? Why have we failed? What is it that needs to be done? What needs to happen? So that's what we're talking about uh, in Nigeria. And really very interesting to look at this. It's not as though uh, our leadership on the continent has not been conscious of the challenge of the need for this fundamental transformation of our economies away from being producers and exporters of raw materials, transformation of the economy, modernization, industrialization, and so on. We've known this all the time and tried to do something. But I'm saying that uh, last week, the Nigerian manufacturers were saying to me, we have not succeeded. 55 years later, I met with President Buhari. We talked about this thing, and we agreed that this time, there's a new administration which has just been elected. Uh, new government is just being, is being formed that this time we, we cannot fail. We can't repeat a story of a 55 years and say we have not succeeded. And it's quite clear that <clears throat> when you look at the Nigerian challenge of industrialization, um, that story is repeated in many of our countries on the continent. It's not unique to Nigeria. And um, if Nigeria succeeds as it, as it should, and indeed the manufacturers and government were very militant that they need, we need to succeed, uh, indeed I think if, we, if they do succeed, it would be very important in terms of uh, addressing this challenge continentally because that would give us a, a, a very good example of what it is that needs, needs to be done. And one of the issues that's uh, very hotly debated then in this context was the issue of the economic partnership agreements with the EU. Uh, the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria militantly hostile to these economic partnership agreements. No, no, no. Talk to the government. The government say if we agree to those partnership agreements, say goodbye to industrialization of Nigeria. Uh, so so what are, what's going to happen? Kenya, uh, Last year, I think it was, uh, when the East Africans, that group that was negotiating with the, with the EU, the partnership agreement, when they all signed, Kenya said, we are not signing. The European Union then said to Kenya, fine, uh, 
we give you from, from a particular date, we are going to impose duties on various of your project, uh, products which you export into the EU market. Within two weeks, Kenya signed. And the Nigerians were telling me that in their region, they're the first two countries to sign the economic partnership agreements were Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. In that instance, because the EU said to both countries, if you don't sign, we are going to impose duties on your cocoa. And they signed. <coughs> I'm mentioning that to say I don't know what Nigerians are going to do. They are very hostile to this, and understandably, quite correctly. Quite correctly, because to you, the, the industrialization that needs to take place needs protection. You can't say we are building reciprocal uh, economic relations between us and the EU, not today. The imbalance in terms of strength and capacity is too big. It can't be reciprocal. Though the Europeans do say, no, no, we'll phase it in over a period of 10 years. It's like over the next 10 years, they are going to stand still while we catch up with them. But in the next 10 years, they are going to be moving forward. We might move forward ourselves, but will the gap close? Now, uh, interim committee. Uh, is this an area in which we should intervene? Yes, alumni. To try and help the continent to answer this question. We don't want to be perpetual exporters of raw materials. In any case, look at the prices of those raw materials now. We have collapsed. Uh, why don't we industrialize and modernize our economies? Practically, what do we do to achieve that? Because nobody on the continent uh, does not know that that's the way, that's the direction in which we should go. So I'm, I'm therefore saying, I think uh, the program of action that must come out of the discussions tomorrow is going to be very important. To say, what are these matters on which we must focus practically? Uh, I think in particular because uh, I think if the, your, your forum comes out with a program of work, a program of action, on these critical issues that are critical to move the continent forward in whatever area, um, whether it's issues of political governance, as were addressed in terms of discussing corruption in the ruling parties in China, uh, whether it's a matter about uh, issues of peace and stability and, and, and all that, as we just discussed in London, or these issues about socioeconomic transformation and so on, as we're discussing in Lagos and Abuja, uh, we'll have to decide where, which out of these issues should we make a practical intervention, in which of these. I'm saying that it may very well be that what comes out of uh, the alumni forum, in terms of pra that practical program of action, may indeed become a program of action which would be taken up across the continent to say that at last there's a, some clear direction as to what it is that we need to do about what, and then provoke a response, uh, uh, incite a response across the continent so that all of us on across the continent get engaged in these particular matters in, in, a, in, a, in a united way. And that might bring about the, uh, the changes which uh, yeah, our speakers, Professor Parker and Gareth and uh, uh, Obenewa, were saying we need desperately. So this is your challenge. Uh, and uh, let's, let's have dinner. I hope that in this dinner was tomorrow, <laughs> because then we would have listened to what you have decided about what action you are going to take. But thanks a lot and good luck tomorrow. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>